Are poor people really poor? This is an article by Dahlia Zaid, founder and managing director of FWD Consultancy. We build and grow brands. You'll find in the written document that will be on the FWD Consultancy LinkedIn page, as well on YouTube, charts, visuals, and my bio. Thank you for listening today. We researchers like to define everything, which is absolutely fine. This is what we do for a living, right? We need to collect data, articulate data in a way that the audience would relate to, fit within a business planning context. Here today we speak of aspirants, those who live less than one dollar a day. I have to admit, there is a point in my career where I was ashamed of myself. After long years of working in the industry, apparently I have become too confident, maybe. Had this ever happened to you? I tend to predict the outcome of a research the minute I read the brief. Well, I have to say I'm pretty good at that. And most of the time I'm super correct especially with advertising. I could read the respondent face when we were testing before they say a word and they retranslate that, what they're saying to what they're actually saying, i.e. how would they behave. I'm sure you can relate if you're in the insights business, if you have helped create brands on uh, spot on insights. How many times have you heard consumers or shoppers say X and when you check the data later on after you've launched, well, they've behaved as Y. Sometimes the question is not asked correctly. Sometimes the body language is ignored. Sometimes, you know what? Consumers just don't know how they feel about the topic until the purchase moment where all the needs he has inside or she has inside and brand options, all of that narrative we have built in the brain of the consumer comes up in the moment of purchase. And then all the drivers of purchase are conjured up and you make a choice. So come again, why was I ashamed? I look back at a global project that popped in um, during my Mondelez days. It was on aspirants. It took me to, uh, you know, Brazil, India, Russia, South Africa, lots and lots of uh, emerging markets, multiple countries to just understand who are the aspirants. We are asked to define it. At, yeah, sure, lots of charts, and you can find a lot of those in the written version of this article. People who live less than four or ten dollars a day and the aspirin opportunity in the EMEA is a sizable one. We're looking at uh, 120 million households representing around 24 of the global aspirin households. An even larger portion when factoring in how large the household size in each region and family members. So we have pockets of success as Mondelez in these markets and we want to grow, yeah? We had a lot of success with chocolate and gum in Egypt, same thing for cocoa beverages in Nigeria and candy, we had biscuits Bimo in Morocco, we have Tang affordable nutrition uh, propositions uh, in different packaging, whether the jug bag, the single serve portfolio, I did a lot of work on the uh, beverage opportunity as well, not just snacking. So to me, cool, it's business as usual, let me pack my bags and I'm off. So yeah, business as usual. But it seems that, you know, that business as usual for me also got me into a pre-thought, yeah. If they are poor, 
they are miserable, they are anxious about daily food on the table, they don't have any outlook to life or hope. I was in the slums of India, the townships of Johannesburg, walked in the mud, spoken to consumers, listening intently. But you know what? I was very wrong. I was very, very wrong. These guys are very positive. They have hopes and aspirations. I think the moment where I felt really stupid when a respondent in the township with a leaky roof said in Swahili, I have saved and I plan in two years to get an original Levi's jeans. And I said, oh, really? Why don't you just get a fake one? He gave me a look like, you know, you don't get it. So, well, I guess I needed to, to update my software. And it's so shameful. I mean, I come from a developing world myself. I'm Egyptian. Well, maybe I've become too urban. Maybe I've become too multinational. Too many trips, too many boardrooms. So, came my next project on beverage. I was in tune. I got inspired so much by the insights in that project. And even further, when I have my own consultancy now, I have another project. And guess where? The poorest country in the Middle East, Yemen. On top of that, they have war. And the time I was working there, it was COVID time as well. The type of bonding these people have with each other is just absolutely mesmerizing. I've never seen it before or still to see. I really enjoyed my time with a young homemaker, 20 years plus, preparing breakfast at dawn after dawn prayers to her husband and the kids. Either they go to school or it's homeschooling. At a later hour of the morning, like 10-ish, she sits with herself. Yes, the famous me moment. All of you working in the snacking world, you know that needs space, right? The me moment. We all have it across the globe. You reflect, breathe, and get ready for the day ahead. It's your Zen moment, a moment that the famous Yemeni shai with condensed milk is served and appreciated. It's the uh, brand, El Montez, that I worked on. It's condensed milk, and it's the market leader. So some neighbors would pop in, maybe siblings sharing the home as well, so a bit of sharing. The tribal spirit is surely very strong, and the head of the tribe has a strong say. Some Western communities may find this limiting, yet it is the very thing that, as a collective society, indeed gives them strength to carry on. Are they upset in any way? Yeah, sure. They're like every other person. They're concerned about the future, mainly maintaining good, healthy life. Resources are thin, but they rely on their community, and that's what makes it very, very strong, the bonding. This is what makes their culture strong, and this is what the culture taught them. Faith has shortly big a part of it. Possibly less exposure to social media. You know when they say you are the company you keep? They are certainly well-knitted web in that respect. In many ways, exposure to culture led me to a lot of insights about the world, about my work, but also about myself. I had learned a lot. And one tip for you, never judge. Let go of prejudices. You don't know their journeys and they don't know yours. Now, in building brands over the years, I took that on board and it served me well. Whether it's Yemen, India, Brazil, Egypt, South Africa, Russia. Yes, aspirants are optimistic. They have hopes, dreams. They are extremely resourceful and amazing in that respect. They juggle. They strive. But in a good way. All within their community. I guess we city people just take it for granted that there are solutions for everything. It's just a press of a button, right? But for them, 
they need to get a solution at the minimum cost. If you want to go to these markets, enter in the psyche of these people. Think about it. You're giving value at a minimum cost for you as an organization to maximize your margins. So in a way, we're thinking the same way, right? Look at this uh, guy called Everton. He's a teenager from Sao Paulo. Read on the profile. Do you feel you know him? Sure you do. He's your next no door neighbor, I guess, teenager. Or maybe you have a teenager in the house. My God, the common themes at different life stages are having straggling, staggering similarities. I love it. I enjoy my work so much. All of these observations over the years. But now back to Earth. What do businesses do to go global? Your entry point is understanding the psyche and their drivers to live. They think differently in applications maybe, but the high level insight is the same. They are humans. Then you have to think about your category and what stage it is in. We all know that we can shape a market as we want to, as a function of how much that company wants and willing to invest, how big is big, and then how big is the price, how much talent, how much money. Each category has a curve, and you know it. Let me give you an example. I worked on yogurt in Yemen. It's very, very basic. They were just having plain yogurt. Yeah. And a tiny share of Activia, Danone's Activia that was imported from Saudi. But then if you want to look at what the end game is, look at Denmark, the Netherlands. You do know the progression and you make choices. I recall that um, innovation workshop on yogurt in Yemen. We had so many potential concepts. So do we go to yogurt with fruit or digestive or um, probiotics or just vitamins and minerals due to you know the dire situation and the illnesses? Which would be the priority? Anyway, that was really a good, interesting exercise. And then again, what is the price point, given it's a very poor market? Uh, that's really a discussion I've had so many times in working in emerging markets. Now, the showstopper to this growth potential is the ability to build relevance and meaning within the product bundle, understanding interlocking consumption and usage, then communicate with finesse. Don't underestimate a local agency, the insights. If you're running a global project, would you have ever thought that Snack World would compete with these sets of, look at this chart. My vote will always go for seeing is believing. There is so much value in observing, listening and understanding. Working across geographies is both inclusive and exclusive. You just need to find that sweet spot as a global brand for longevity in that new market. I'm Dalia Zaid and I hope you enjoyed that piece. About me, I have brought international experience gained across multiple categories and global brands extensive understanding of integrated business planning, brand building, insights, analytics, digital commerce, customer experience, and innovation. You can check out my YouTube channel with my work reel and speaking um, potential forums and so forth. Thank you for listening.